we have a guest speaker today, as Jay alluded to during his prayer. Timothy Hawk is a graduate of Appalachian Bible College. Amanda and I both were students along with him. He graduated in 2019 from ABC uh, in missions was his major, right? Okay, I'm going all off memory. He's shaking his head yes, so. <laughs> uh, but Timo, his name is Timo, okay? Not Timothy. That's what we always called him in college. Timo uh, was a missions major and uh, also graduated with Bible, as all ABC students do. And he's here visiting with us. We just recently started supporting him, and he's going to be sharing a little bit about what he's going to be doing when he goes back to Uruguay because he is a missionary uh, a child from Uruguay. His family has grown up there. So, uh, Timo, come on up. We're glad that you're here with us this morning, and uh, pray for you as you share and preach the word this morning. Thank you. Thanks, Tyler. Good morning. It is great to be with you guys this morning. I've been in contact uh, through email with different people from the church, and so and I've known Tyler for and Amanda for years now. And so, um, when they gave me the opportunity uh, to come, I was very glad to do so. And so, it really is great to be with you this morning. Just to start out with, um, how many times in the span of a year do you hear about the country of Uruguay, South America? I always try to pay attention to see how many times I notice it, whether it's mentioned in maybe a movie, in a book, um, in an article, and I can tell you right now that it's not a country that you hear from very often at all. So here's your chance, because I would like to share with you a little bit about Uruguay this morning. So the first slide, uh, if you go to the next slide, who am I? Uh, My name is Timothy Hawk, and I actually grew up as a missionary kid in Uruguay, South America. If you go to the next slide, there's a picture of my family. I'm the one circled there on on the right. Um, That was taken uh, a couple weeks ago. And I'm just kidding, that was, that was taken years ago. My family, my parents have been missionaries in Uruguay, and they're still serving there. It's been almost 30 years that they have been there. I've mentioned Uruguay quite a few times now. If you're not for sure where Uruguay is located, um, on the next slide I have a map. Really quickly with Uruguay circled. Uh, right there. The easiest way to find Uruguay that I tell people is find the country of Brazil, which is a much better known country than Uruguay, which is a very large country in South America. And if you look right below Brazil, you will find the country of Uruguay. Uruguay is about the size of uh, Washington State and it has a population of about three million people. And half the population, a million and a half people, live in the capital city of Montevideo, which is at the very southernmost tip of the country. Uruguay isn't heard about um, very much, but I would say that one of the biggest things that Uruguay is probably known for is soccer. Uh, Uruguay loves soccer. They play soccer all the time. They have a really good uh, national team, and they have players that, from Uruguay that are all over the world uh, playing on some of the, on the biggest clubs. So if you've heard about Uruguay, it's very possible that soccer was, was one of the reasons that you might have heard about it. They speak Spanish in Uruguay, and... Like I said, God gave me an amazing privilege of growing up there. Uh, My family was in the capital city of Montevideo. Um, I was born there, I grew up there, and I was able to to learn the culture firsthand. I was able to to learn the language. Um, I was able to create excellent uh, contacts and relationships with the people there. And I was able to see firsthand of what the needs were 
in that country. When I was around six or seven years old, I made the best decision that I've ever made in my entire life, and that was when I put my trust in Christ to be my Savior, to take away my sins. I remember praying with my dad, and I recognized that I was a sinner, that I was separated from God because of my sin, and the only way that that relationship could be restored was through Jesus Christ. And that was the best decision that I've ever made in my entire life when I gave my life to Christ. And I remember when, when I accepted Christ that I started meditating on everything that God had done for me. And I was thinking about, and as I was thinking about it, the only logical conclusion that I could come to was that if God did all of that for me by sending Jesus Christ to die for my sins, and if he loved me that much, everything that he had done for me, the very least I could do was to give my life back to him for him to use in whatever way that he wanted. That was, that was the only logical conclusion that I could come to. If he did all of that for me, the very least I could do was give my life back to him. So, ever since a very young age, God burdened me to go back to Uruguay to serve him there. After I finished high school, I went to Appalachian Bible College. That's where I met uh, Tyler, and I studied there for four years. I graduated, it's been uh, two years ago now, um, with, a, with a degree in missions and Bible and theology. And after I graduated, I went on to do a year-long pastoral internship at a church in Shenandoah Junction, West Virginia, uh, Fellowship Bible Church. I did a year-long pastoral internship there, and it was during my internship that God really started opening up the doors for me to go back to Uruguay. And that is where I am right now. I am working on uh, raising my financial support so that I can go back to Uruguay. I'm hoping um, possibly next year. So, as I am pursuing this, an important question that needs to be answered is why? And um, is why? Why am I returning to Uruguay? Do I have a knowledge about the culture? Uh, do I know the language? Yeah. Yes, I, I do. That's, that's where I grew up. That's where I've spent most of my life. Uh, but is that where, is that why I'm going back to Uruguay? No, that, that is not the reason. God can use and equip anybody, anywhere, for his glory. The Bible, if you look at the Bible, the Bible is full of illustrations of how God used the least likely people to accomplish great things for him. So just because I, I might have a knowledge about the culture, the language, that is not the reason why I am going back. Does Uruguay have spiritual needs? Is that why I'm going back to Uruguay? Does Uruguay have spiritual needs? Yes, they do. Uruguay has the most secularized society in South America. Uruguay has the highest percentage of atheists and agnostics in South America. Uruguay has the highest suicide rate in South America. So, does Uruguay have spiritual needs? Yes, Uruguay has spiritual needs. Is that why I'm going back to Uruguay? Not necessarily. It doesn't matter where you go. There's always going to be a spiritual need because of the presence of sin. So wherever sin is, there's going to be a spiritual need. So why am I going back to Uruguay? Well, what it comes down to is obedience. 
God has given me a burden to go back to Uruguay. He's opened up the doors for me to return. And he doesn't give me peace about doing anything else. So it doesn't matter what knowledge I have. It doesn't matter what the country is like. If God wants me there, I have to go. So who is sending me back to Uruguay? Well, Fellowship Bible Church, where I did my internship at, they have lovingly agreed to be my sending church. And I've also partnered um, with the mission board. Um, You can go to the next slide. Biblical Ministries Worldwide. And um, this mission board is going to help me throughout this process and, and hold me accountable. So God has given me a burden. He's opened up the doors for me. He's provided me with um, a sending church. So when I get to Uruguay, what exactly am I going to be doing? And that is the next question. What am I going to be doing when I get to Uruguay? Well, in 2014, a group of pastors and leaders in Uruguay started a Bible college called FEBU, which stands for Facultad de Estudios Bíblicos del Uruguay. Um, Rough translation would be the Uruguayan College of Biblical Studies. These pastors and leaders realize that there is a huge need for biblical training in South America. And biblical training is something that is highly, highly lacking in South America. They don't have the, the ease as we do of traveling a few hours and going to a Bible college and getting that sort of training. It is very hard to get that training. And so the churches are lacking in in leaders and um, to take over these ministries that have been started there over the past many, many years. And so these leaders realized this need and started this Bible college and is praying that God can help them to fill this need of biblical training through them as they train their students with the Bible. So I've been in contact with them, and they've accepted me to come back and work with them as they they train these young people in Uruguay. I'm going to be helping in a a variety of different ways, and one of the main things that they need right now is someone to help out with uh, their tech support. They want to be able to get classes online so that they can reach not only the country of Uruguay, but that they can reach people all around South America with these classes with these classes um, on the Bible. And so they need someone that can help them through that process. They also need someone that's daily um, discipling the students. Most of the professors are, are full-time pastors, and most of them work full-time as well. They're, they're, they don't have a lot of, of time to be able to invest daily into the students, and so they need someone that is doing that as well. And I'm hoping to be able to teach in there in the future as well. I'm going to be working on pursuing more education so I can teach as well. So that's what I'm going to be doing when I get to Uruguay. The final question is, yes, that is, that was Fable, um, is how can you help? What can you do? How can you partner with me as I pursue to obey God? by doing this? Well, first of all, it's something that everyone can help with, is prayer. You can partner with me through prayer. God has given us an incredible opportunity where we can pray for one another. It doesn't matter if we're separated by by continents. It doesn't matter if we're separated by oceans. We have an incredible opportunity to pray for one another, and I need you to partner with me, first of all, in prayers. And you have no idea how your prayers affect the lives of missionaries. Secondly, you can help financially. I am devoting all of my time to this ministry. Therefore, I am needing to raise monthly financial support so that I can dedicate all of my time 
to this. And this might be a way that you could partner with me as well. If any of you would like to receive a monthly update, I send out um, updates every month. I have a sign-up sheet out on the table. I have uh, prayer cards. I have um, brochures with uh, a lot of this information that I just shared with you. And if any of you have any more questions, uh, if you come and talk to me, I'd love to talk with you about this. For the rest of our time this morning, I would like to open God's Word and look at a couple verses from the Bible. So if you would open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. We're going to be looking at the first two verses of Ephesians, chapter 5. And while, while you are turning there, um, I want to ask you a question. In your everyday lives, when you encounter different relationships, whether it be your relationship with your family, your relationship with your coworkers, your relationships with complete strangers, and even your relationship with God, how would you define your love in each one of those relationships? So let me ask that again. In your everyday lives, when you encounter different relationships, whether it be your relationship with your family, your relationship with your coworkers, your relationship with complete strangers, and your relationship with God, how would you define your love in each one of those relationships? Let's read Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. From what we can see in these verses is that there is a certain way that God wants our love to be defined. He says it right there in verse 2. He says, And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. God wants us to love in the same way that Christ loved us. He said, Look at how Christ loved you. I want you to love in the exact same way. So what I would like to do this morning is I want to look at how Christ loved us. And I want to look at three different ways that our love needs to be defined as we look at how Christ loved us. I'm going to look at three different ways that our love needs to be defined by looking at how Christ loved us. Definition number one, our love needs to be a choice. Let's look at how Christ loved us. How did Christ love us? Christ's love for us was a choice. When we go back to the very beginning of the world, when God created the heavens and the earth, when man sinned against God, God, who had literally brought all of creation into existence by just a few words of his mouth, he could, have, he could have ended everything and started it all over right then. There was no reason for him not to. He could have started all over. But guess what he did? He chose to love us. He made that choice. There was no reason for him. To do that. It was a choice that he made to love us. So how does this apply to us? Well, guess what? If Christ chose to love us, according to this verse, our love 
also needs to be a choice. With the people in our lives, the different relationships, there are times, even in my life, there are times when I don't want to love my family. There are times when, when I don't want to love my coworkers. There are times when, with, with complete strangers that I, that I don't even know, I don't feel like loving them most of the time. And what about my relationship with God? There are times when, when sin is very attractive to me. There are times when I don't want to read the Bible. I don't want to pray. But in each one of those relationships, that is where that choice comes in. We have to make that choice to love in each one of those relationships every day. Because if that's how Christ loved us, that is how we need to be loving as well. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter if the people are very unlovable. That is a choice that we have to make every day. Day. So definition number one, our love needs to be a choice. Definition number two, our love needs to be sacrificial. Again, let's go back. Let's look at how Christ loved us. How did Christ love us? Look in verse two, it says, and walk in love as Christ loved us and it gave himself up. For us. Christ loved us so much that he sacrificed everything. He sacrificed the ultimate thing that you could sacrifice, his very life, for us. He sacrificed so much. And if you look at his life, the, the daily things that he sacrificed, just so that we could have salvation. So how does this apply to ourselves? Well, guess what? If Christ loved us sacrificially, our love also needs to be sacrificial. With our relationship with God, we can say that we love him but how many of you are willing to sacrifice certain areas in your life for him? What about, what about your comfort? I know with me, it's very hard to sacrifice my comfort for God. Going out and telling people about the gospel is a very uncomfortable thing to do. It takes us out of our comfort zone. It's a very controversial subject. And many of us, including myself, tend to avoid it because of that. How many of you are willing to sacrifice your comfort because you love God? How many of you are willing to sacrifice your plans for God? So many of us have, have plans for our lives that are all laid out, and it is so hard to sacrifice those things that we want so bad for something else that God might want us to do. Do you love God so much that you are willing to sacrifice your plans for him? What about sin? There are, there are certain areas of sin in every one of our lives that we do not want to sacrifice for God. We just love them too much that we do not want to let go of them. Do you love God so much that you are willing to sacrifice those areas of sin in your life for him? What about your relationship with other people? Our time is one of the most precious things that we have, and we use it very, very selfishly. How, how many of you are willing to sacrifice some of your time for these different relationships? What about um, our energy? We have a very limited amount of energy every day that we, can, that we can give out. And again, these are some things that 
we tend to use very selfishly as well. How, much, how many of you are willing to sacrifice some of your energy for these different relationships in your life? Christ loved us so sacrificially. Guess what? According to this verse, that's the same way that we need to love every day. Our love needs to be sacrificial. So definition number one, our love needs to be a choice. Definition number two, our love needs to be sacrificial. And the third Definition is our love needs to be unconditional. So let's look at how Christ loved us. How did Christ love us? Well, his love for us was completely unconditional. That means that Christ loved us in the spiritual state that we were in. It didn't, we didn't have to do anything to earn his love, and we don't have to do anything to keep his love for us. There's nothing that we have to do. There is no condition on his love for us. It is completely unconditional. He loves us. It doesn't matter what spiritual state we're in. It doesn't matter how we treat him. It doesn't matter how we are living. He loves us unconditionally. So guess what? If Christ loved us, if he loves us so unconditionally, guess what? Our love every day needs to be unconditional as well. I would say that most of the time, our love for others is completely conditional. We only love them because they love us. They treat us right. They're kind to us. And therefore, those are the people that are the easiest to love. Those are the people that we love. We love them because they love us. But if they treat us bad, if they're not a very likable person, if they're somebody that that rubs us wrong, we tend to not love those people. That is not unconditional love. Many, most of the time, our love for God is also conditional. We love God and we serve God when he lets everything go just right in our lives, when he blesses us, when, um, when everything is going smoothly. But as soon as he lets something happen in our lives that is uncomfortable, that that hurts, that is hard to go through, that is painful. As soon as something like that happens, we turn our backs on God, we get we get mad at God, we question why He's doing this to us. That that is completely conditional love. Our love for God is so conditional. If Christ loved us so unconditionally, our love in every one of these relationships needs to be unconditional as well. It doesn't matter how people treat us. It doesn't matter who they are or what they're like. We have to love them. It doesn't matter what God lets happen in our lives it doesn't matter what circumstances he puts us in. It doesn't matter um, the situations. We need to love him no matter what, unconditionally. So, to conclude, our love, first of all, needs to be a choice. Our love needs to be a choice. Secondly, our love needs to be sacrificial. And thirdly, our love needs to be 
unconditional. And these are only three different ways that Christ loved us. The Bible says that God's love for us is so immense that there's no way we can comprehend it all. We could spend a lifetime studying on how Christ loved us, and we will, we will still never be able to understand it all. These are just three different ways I, I chose to look at tonight. So I challenge you, study Christ's love for you and apply it to your lives. Because according to this verse, where it says, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Apply these things to your lives and love as Christ loved us. I want to finish with the question that I started out with. In your everyday lives, when you encounter different relationships, whether it be your relationship with your family, your relationship with your coworkers, your relationship with even complete strangers, and most importantly, your relationship with God, how would you define your love in each one of those relationships? I pray that it would be defined as Christ-like. Let's finish with a word of prayer, and um, afterwards, if any of you have any questions about Uruguay, uh, feel free to, to talk to me. I would love to talk with you about this, this burden that God has placed in my heart. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we come before you, and we are very sinful people, and we desperately need you. I pray that you would keep on um, working in our lives, Lord. Thank you for being so incredibly patient with us. I pray that you would keep on working in us, making us more like you. Um, I pray especially, Lord, in the area of how we love in every one of our relationships every day, that you would help us to love more like Christ loved us. I pray that we would never stop learning, Lord, about this incredible love that, that you have loved us with. Thank you, Lord, for this day that, that we can serve you and glorify you. Um, thank you for uh, this church body, and um, I pray that, that you would be glorified through every one of us today. We love you, we praise you, and we pray all of these things in your name. Amen.